systematic and expository study of the Bible at the Deeper Life Bible Church offers you an enriching steady spiritual growth, thus opening your eyes to God's own way of righteousness. In this case, you will have the opportunity to listen to one such enriching Bible study. So, prepare your heart to be blessed.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you once again today because you have drawn us near to yourself. As children draw near to the Father, so that the Father will speak to the children and the children will know the mind of the Father. Father, we thank you because you have not pushed us aside as strangers, as rebels, as people that do not have any connection with you. But day by day, week after week, you bring us nearer to yourself so that we can know your mind. Because the multitudes, the majority of the people in this world, in the millions, myriads of people, they're very ignorant of the requirements of God, of the demands of God, of the righteous standard of God. And so they're ignorant of what the requirement, the standard will be on the day of judgment. But ours has been the privilege that before that great judgment day, we will know by what standard, by what rule you are going to judge man. And day by day, week after week, you reveal unto us that it's going to be a terrible day, a day of the gnashing of teeth, a day of weeping, a day of doom and darkness, a day of great judgment upon the inhabitants of the world. But you have given us this privilege to know your mind to know your way, to know the rule, to know the standard, and to prepare to meet the Lord our God. O oh Lord, we are praying that in the short time we spend in this world, we will realize it's a time of probation, a time to prepare to be with the Lord on the final day. Therefore, Lord, we pray you help us not to be careless with our souls, not to be careless with the knowledge you are giving us, not to be careless of the way you are revealing unto us. Not to be careless with the privilege and the opportunity of preparing to meet the Lord our God. We pray that today, O oh Lord, as we read of your judgment in the world, as we read of your ways, of the way you feel towards sin in the word of God, we pray, O oh Lord, you make us to be wise, wise unto salvation, that we will prepare to meet the Lord our God and we will flee from the judgment to come. We look up to you. We bless your name. We thank you because you love us. And it is not your will that any of us here should perish. Lord, we pray that we will not perish. Be with us, O Lord. Enlighten us. Open our eyes of understanding that we may see what we ought to see from your word. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today, we still continue with a study of the book of Genesis. Today we're looking at Genesis chapter 6. Actually, we're studying from verse 1 through to verse 13. I'll read with you just a few of those verses. Genesis chapter 6. Please open your Bible. We begin at verse 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and he took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his this shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they bare children to them. And the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man, whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man, and beast, and a creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. For it repented me that I have made them. Verse 8, 
But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Verse 13, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Here we have the account of the great wickedness that came into the old world. As men multiplied, so they perverted their ways and became corrupt in the sight of God. You remember as we studied in chapter 1 of Genesis, that when God finished the work of creation, we're told that God saw every sin that he had made. And behold, it was very good. But now, as, I, as we have read together in verse 5 of our passage, we're told that God saw that the wickedness of man had become so great in the earth. For some time, the Spirit of God strove with the antediluvians, that is, those people that lived before the deluge, before the flood. God convicted them. There were convictions in the heart and admonitions in the conscience. God strove against the ways of evil that they were following. You know what happened? They refused to turn from their sins unto God. They resisted the Spirit of God. And God's Spirit will not continue to strive with man or to convict men's hearts indefinitely. Eventually, judgment came upon all sinners. Why are we learning all this? Number one, because it's in the Bible. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is good. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the men of God, you and I, may be perfect, really furnished unto all good works. Not only that, the Bible says very clearly that the things that were written aforetime are written for our learning upon whom the ends of the world are come. The days in which we live are similar. To those days before the flood, the world has not learned from the dreadful example set before them by the men of Noah's day. Today, men have multiplied greatly on the face of the earth, and the same sins with which they provoked God to anger and brought upon themselves the wrath and the judgment of God, those same sins are committed today without any restraint. As, as the men of Noah's day were indifferent to God's warnings against sin, so also are the people of this generation, the people of this age, they are indifferent to all the warnings of God regarding sin. You remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ from Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 to 39. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. There's a lot for us to learn in the lesson of today, and to grasp and to understand everything so clearly. We're going to divide to three parts. Number one, the cause of moral downfall. There's always a cause. If you find an individual that had been morally sound, righteous, godly before, but now there is a moral downfall, there is a cause to it. If you find a family that knew God, a family that was godly and righteous, and now there is a moral downfall, spiritual downfall, there is a cause to that. You'll find a nation that feared God, a nation that followed after God, a nation that exalted the word of God, the principles from scriptures. But now things have gone down morally, spiritually. There is a cause for that downfall. So number one, the cause of moral downfall. Number two, judgment determined upon depraved men. You see, judgment is inevitable, unavoidable. Once men become depraved, polluted, corrupted, unholy, ungodly in the sight of God. Judgment will be determined upon depraved men. But thank God, thank God, that no matter 
how dark may be the age, no matter how corrupt may be the society, no matter how defiled many, many people may be, there will still be some few, some few people. There will be some people that are seeking the face of God and they find grace in the sight of God. So we find number three, God's grace for Noah. Let's go to point one. The cause of moral downfall. As you look at the chapter that we have, at the chapter that we have read, look at what God has said. Look at the verdict upon the generation, upon the men and the women of that time, the society of that day. And see that a moral downfall has taken place. You remember that man and woman were created in the image of God. In the righteousness and holiness of God. But these people that were created in the image of God. Let's look at what has become of them. Verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. Only evil continually. Look at verse 11. And the earth was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. Verse 12. And God looked upon the earth. And behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. What was the cause of this moral downfall? The disobedience of Adam and Eve and its result hung over the succeeding generations of Adam as a terrible pall, just covered them like a blanket. The first sin soon brought forth much evil fruit. As men multiplied upon the earth, sin grew into a vast stock of evil and culminated in the destruction of man in the days of Noah. The more sinners, the more sin. Infectious diseases are most destructive and dangerous in populous cities. And so sin is a spreading leprosy in the midst of the people as they multiply. And so we find that the cause of the moral downfall was to be found in the fall of Adam and Eve. In the sin of Adam and Eve. In that sin passed unto all men. But you need to mark this. In a passage in which we have read today, there's a much specified immediate cause of the moral downfall. What was that? Look at it from chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. And there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bear children unto them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. This is a straightforward passage. But you see, many people have complicated a passage like this. They have concentrated on trying to find out who the sons of God were. And they have asked some questions from themselves, which they think they could not answer. They said, could anybody of that generation be referred to as the son of God? Could any of those people living at that time, those human beings, could any of them be referred to as the sons of God? And the answer they could give is that nobody could be referred to as the sons of God. And they have gone so far in finding out the identification of these sons of God. And the theory they have come out with is that these sons of God were angels. That these angels, they left heaven and they came into the midst of the earth and they came to make marriages with the daughters of men. And they said the reason for the moral downfall, the reason for the difficulty is that the angels came to intermarry with the human beings at that time. 
To them, that is the only interpretation they have. But we do not accept that interpretation. Why don't we accept that interpretation? Well, because the Bible, number one, is not written for the angels. It's written for us who are human beings to learn something from it. And you will not find the direct mention of the angels in that place. Not only that, you remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. When he said that the angels never marry. They neither marry nor give birth to children. Those are the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ. So then we understand this passage is talking about the marriage of the godly with the ungodly. The marriage of the righteous with the unrighteous. You see, there was still some remnant, faithful few, a few people that had the knowledge of God. The people that were called by the name of God in the posterity of sage. And these are referred to here as the sons of God. And you remember the lesson that Jesus brought out of this passage. He didn't say that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man, that the angels married daughters of men, and it will be like that at the coming of the Son of Man. No, not at all. He said, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days of in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall, shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So then, what the Lord is teaching us here is that the immediate cause, the specified cause of this moral downfall here was the mixed marriages. Between the sons of God, the godly seed, the godly people, the people that are called by God's name, they intermarried the deed with the daughters of men, those who are strangers to God and strangers to godliness. You see, when those who profess to know God begin to intermarry with those who do not know God, the result is always calamitous. When the godly intermarried with the ungodly, the tide of righteousness ebbed so low that destruction became certain and inevitable. The Bible is most emphatic in its teaching that there cannot be a mixing of the righteous with the unrighteous in marriage. Because righteousness is a true ingredient whose purity can stand no mixing with impurity. God's righteous people cannot have fellowship in marriage with the unrighteous. The scriptures plainly teach that Christians are not to marry those who are not Christians. The righteous are not to marry the unrighteous. Let's look at the uniform testimony of the word of God. In fact, even from the time of Abraham, in Genesis chapter 24, verse 3. Genesis chapter 24, verse 3. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. If you have the seed of Abraham, you'll have that same conviction within you, that you will not get married to the people, the Canaanitish people, the worldly people, the sinful people all around you. This was a concern in the heart and in the family of Isaac as well. And the wife of Isaac were told in Genesis chapter 27, verse 46. Genesis chapter 27, verse 46. And Rebekah said unto Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do to me? You see the concern in the hearts of godly people, in the hearts of those who are calling upon God, that they will not intermarry with the unrighteous people, adulterous people, with the people that are ignorant of the ways of God, ignorant of the righteousness of God, ignorant of the worship of God. It is still the same today. If you are born again, 
If you are following the Lord, if you are a child of God, if the mark of the Lord is upon you, if you have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, if your goal is to make heaven and to please the Lord, you as a Christian will not go and choose a wife from the ungodly throng, from the ungodly multitude all around us. In Exodus chapter 34, Exodus chapter 34, from verse 12, Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. The word of God is still plain. Take heed unto thyself. Young men, young women, you have not married, but you say you know the Lord. If you go to, to, if you go to study overseas, if you go to our business overseas, if you go anywhere to a strange land, if you go anywhere in trading, in business, in education, or traveling for any reason, in the midst of the people of this world, take heed unto yourself. Temptation may come. The desire may come. The idea may come. Friends may suggest it to you. And when you are away from the people of God, the suggestion may be very strong. But take heed that thou make not a covenant, marriage covenant. You do not take an unbeliever to the registry to marry. You do not go to the family of unbelieving people to say you are looking for a wife. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest it be a snare, a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their grooves. For thou shalt worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, their gods, and after they are, uh, go a warning, and they go a warning after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. Thou take, and thou take of their daughters unto thy son, and their daughters go a warning after their gods, and thou make thy sons go a warning after their gods. You see, whenever you go into that unequal yoke, it always brings a moral downfall. It always brings a false worship. It always brings a displeasure before the Lord. Let's look at Joshua. Joshua chapter 23. Joshua chapter 23. Reading from verses 12 to 13. Joshua 23 verse 12. Else if ye do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and dare unto you know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive them, drive out of any of these nations from before you. But they shall be snares and traps unto you, and scourges in your sides, and thorns in your eyes, until ye perish from off this good land where the Lord your God has given you. Here Joshua, by the word of the Lord, told the children of Israel. And he said, if they went to marry the unbelievers, the idolatrous people, who are still living among them, he said, there will be real trouble, perplexity, tribulation unto them. He said, there will be snares unto them. Snares from the hands of the devil. Snares from the hands of Satan. And when you as a believer go to marry, an unbeliever becomes a snare unto you and a trap unto you and scourges in your sights and turns in your eyes until they perish from all the good land that the Lord had given them. You see the judgment that will come upon them? Not only that moral degradation, moral downfall will come upon them as a result of that unequal yoke. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. Now hear you, you find that believing parents are not to give consent to an unbeliever marrying their believing son, but their believing daughter. And as a church, we are not to give consent we're not to show approval. We're not to show agreement. We're not to show any positive attitude if a believer in our midst goes to stretch out in a sign in marriage to an unbeliever. 
And if you're a real child of God, you will never show a positive attitude. You will never show your approval. Look at verse 3. Neither shalt thou make marriages for them. Thy daughter, thou shalt not give unto a son. When you allow a sister in the church to go and marry an unbelieving man outside, and you give your approval. Then it means that by the consent you are given, by the approval you are given, by the good attitude you are showing, by the support you are showing, you are giving the daughter in the church unto an unbelieving man outside. Now his daughter shall thou take unto thy son. We will not take unto any son, any brother, any child of God, unbelieving woman outside. And I'm going to tell you that a lot of the people outside, a lot of the people outside, the people are, are saying, I've seen somebody in the Catholic church, is a real sister. I doubt a lot of those things very much. And I have seen some people in the Seventh-day Adventist church where they're still worshipping on Saturday and they still believe all the old Mosaic law. I've seen a sister, I've seen a brother there. I doubt it very much. I've seen somebody in that nominal church, in that nominal denomination there, and I know that that person is a real child of God. I doubt a lot of the testimonies that people are giving. And you who give your support, and you who give your word to it, when we're not sure that these people are really born again, we're contravening, we're contradicting the word of God. Look at verse 3. Neither shall thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter, thou shalt not give unto a son. Nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me. That's always the result. That's always the result. Moral downfall. That's always the result. That you find the people that have been on fire for God before. The people that have been godly before. The people that have been studious in the word of God before. The people that have been zealous in the service of the Lord before. Once they go to marry these uh, people they have chosen out of the world, out of the family of Satan. What you find is that all their desires for God, all their desires for righteousness, all their zeal for the things of the Lord will go down. They will turn away from following after the Lord. That thou may, that thou may serve other God. So will the anger of the Lord, the wrath of God, the judgment of God be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. You see, destruction is the sin. Let me tell you this. The easiest way, the quickest way for a denomination to be destroyed spiritually. The quickest way for a, for a church to be destroyed spiritually for the power of God to fade away. The presence of God to fade away, the grace of God to fade away, the spiritual energy to fade away, for that church to be destroyed is just this unequal you. When the younger generation in that church, when they begin to stretch out their hand to the people that do not know God and they begin to marry them, eventually a flood of judgment, the wrath of God, the anger of God will come upon them and they will be exterminated. They may still be there having a name that they leave, but eventually what the Bible says is that you'll discover that they do not really have the life of God in them. They will be dead. That's why the warning is so strong in the New Testament. Look at it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Reading from verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 from verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That is emphatic. That is very straightforward. And that is very strong and powerful. It is a commandment. And it is stated in, a ver in very clear terms. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And you know, the Spirit of God has preserved this for us to warn us. And to remind us that the cause of moral downfall, the immediate cause, specified cause of moral downfall at the time of Noah was this made just in the unequal yoke. And then he wants us now. If we want to avoid the judgment of God, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believeth with an infidel? For, and what agreement, what agreement, what agreement has the temple of God with, with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. Wherefore, come out from among them. 
the early church would have become weak very quickly and very suddenly if they had allowed unequal you. The early church will not have continued for the space of time they continued in the power of God, evangelizing the world, having the power of righteousness and godliness and wisdom if they had allowed unequal you. And you find, you find out in church history, find out in church history, any denomination where there was revival, any denomination where the righteousness, the holiness of God was emphasized. You find out in church history where the people knew God, the grace of God was in their midst. And they began to allow, they began to allow their young people stretching out their hand, looking outside the gate, looking outside the fence, looking outside the, among the people of God. And they go to bring these ungodly people, idol worshipping people, immoral people, people that do not, do not have the righteousness of God. They begin to bring them in. Eventually the power and the presence of God will depart. That's why we're told here in verse 17, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You tell me when somebody who says that he's a believer begins to say that he has seen a Jehovah's Witness he wants to marry. Eventually, the literature of the Jehovah's Witnesses will come in. Literature of Seventh-day Adventists will come in. All the, all the literature that pollutes, that teaches false doctrine, eventually it will come in. And the children will not be able to know the way of the Lord. Eventually the church will be destroyed. What does the Bible say? Wherefore, come out from among them. Don't make marriages with them. And be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. And there is a place where the, church, where the leaders in the church have to be very firm. I have to be very firm. Oh yes, I, I know, I know. I know that they're going to accuse us that we're narrow-minded. I know they're going to accuse us we do not believe in the unity of the whole church because, you know, the idea of the church that many people outside have is that everyone that carries Bible, everyone that is bearing a Christian name, everyone that was baptized as an infant, everyone that says I'm not a pagan, everyone that seems to have a little understanding about God, they say all those people are Christians and the other people are going to accuse us that, uh, you know, we are very straight-minded and uh, straight-laced and narrow-minded and we are very strict and we are the only people that think we're going to get to heaven. I know the, I know the accusation will be there and I'm the one that takes a lot of those accusations more than any any of you but don't let us worry about that don't let us worry about that let us obey the word of god before our young people get married let them pray and pray through let them pray and choose people that believe the same word of god people that believe in justification by faith people that believe in restitution people that believe in holiness people that believe in walking righteously people that believe in the coming rapture people that believe the totality of the word of god then will the church remain pure wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate says the lord and touch not the unclean thing and i will receive you and will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So then you see, marriage of the godly with the ungodly is forbidden of God. And there are some people that will say, my intention is right. My hope is that I want to influence the unrighteous for good, so that I can convert this person I want to marry. You cannot convert anyone. In fact... You'll discover that that thing you are doing, that thing you are trying to do in disobedience against the word of God will make you so powerless and prayerless that you will not be strong anymore. You'll not be zealous anymore. Your faith will be weakened. Your life will be weakened. The presence of God in your life will be weakened. And therefore you cannot do anything to convert all these people that you want to marry unto the Lord. And God cannot bless that which has been done in defiance and disobedience and rebellion against his word. Now this is not to be misinterpreted and misconstrued to mean that those who are converted after their marriage should leave their companion simply because he or she is not saved. No, not at all. Marriage can only be dissolved by death. It is when you, as a believer, a bachelor, a spinster, when you, a believing single person, when you are a believer, you go to join affinity with an unbeliever, to marry an unbeliever, it is when you are disobeying the Lord. Now, we have read that in those days, those sons of God, 
They chose without knowing and without finding out the will of God. They chose the people that they wanted. Out of that choice came the judgment of God upon them. That leads us now to point to judgment determined upon depraved men. Judgment determined upon depraved men. Genesis chapter 6 and in verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. Now let us learn here to start with that the problem of sin was from the heart. The fountain of sin was and still is in men's hearts. The thoughts, the designs, the devices of their hearts were wicked. They did not only do evil just by mere carelessness, but they did evil deliberately, designedly. Wickedness became general and universal, and therefore God had to resolve that he will destroy man for his wickedness. And the same thing we learn today, that uh, there are people that are evil. They have not given their lives to the Lord. What is the reason for this? Well, the reason for this is because the heart is evil. The heart is sinful. The heart is corrupt. The heart is like a spring. It's like a fountain of evil. And everything that flows out of that evil, corrupt, sinful fountain, everything will be evil. Look at Job chapter 15. And verse 16. Job chapter 15, verse 16. How much more abominable and filthy is man, which drinketh iniquity like water. The problem of the heart. Drinketh into the system. Drinketh in from the heart in the heart. It drinketh iniquity like water. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 17. And it is now from verse 9. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You see, that's the very problem. In fact, Jesus said that the problem of sin is a problem of the heart. When the heart is evil, the life will be evil. When the heart is good, the life will be good as well. In Mark chapter 7, reading from verse 21. Mark chapter 7, reading from verse 21. For from within, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Well, sin became general and universal. Among the people of those days, the people became corrupt. They corrupted their ways before the Lord. They corrupted their ways in the sight of the Lord. Now, what was the result? Was God just looking at them as an unconcerned spectator? No, not at all. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, reading from verse 5 again. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. He was concerned. And the Lord said, I will destroy man, whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repented me that I have made them. Now look at verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. And for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So then 
God was displeased, and he manifested and expressed his just and holy displeasure against sin and against the sinners. You see, God makes no provision to make any allowance or tolerance for sin. The same thing today. There is no provision made by God for the tolerance of sin. All sin must be repented of and destroyed. How can that be done? God has provided a remedy for sin. And that remedy is the blood of Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son. When you apply that to the heart by faith, your sins are pardoned and the sins are removed. Otherwise, there will be the judgment of God. Judgment of God. For those who forget the way of God, the way of righteousness, and the way of holiness, if you forget the way of the Lord, the consequence is that there will be judgment. There will be judgment. Let's look at the word of God as we look at the fact that God always brings judgment upon sin. Judgment upon sin. Now we're looking at Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 22. Jeremiah chapter 4, reading from verse 22 and verse 27. I want you to, you know, open your Bible and read with me. And if you discover you are sitting down there or you are outside there and there is no light there, how are you going to read your Bible without light? Therefore, get to the place where there is light. J Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 22. For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sorted children, and they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. You see the condition of those people? Now, what was the consequence of that? In verse 27, For thus says the Lord, For thus as the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. Now, what we learn from this is that God will always bring judgment. If it is an individual that is practicing sin, living in sin, committing sin without batting an eye, without even feeling any restraint in the conscience, judgment will come upon that individual. You have seen in the Bible days how individuals sinned and judgment came upon them. More than that, if it's a family that indulges in sin, a family that goes on in sin, sin unchecked, unabated, Sin unrepented of the judgment of God will come upon that family as a unit. Or if it's a community, if it's a whole city, you have seen Sodom and Gomorrah, how they gave themselves, themselves over to lasciviousness, sin, iniquity, and evil. The judgment of God came upon those cities. You remember Nineveh, how God sent Jonah. And he said that whole city of 120,000 people, they were living in sin. And God warned them, in 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. It may be an individual. It may be a family. It may be a tribe. It may be a city. If they continue in sin, judgment will come. What if it's a whole nation? Well, you know that uh, God told Abraham, he said, the cup of iniquity of the Amorites are not yet, is not yet full. And when the cup became full, he wiped them out. Remember the Amalekites. When God called Saul and he said, The Amalek is coming in remembrance before me. Go there and wipe, destroy all of them. Wipe them out because of the sins they have committed. And so if it's a whole nation, the judgment of God will come. Remember even Israel. Israel, the apple of the eye of the Lord. When they lived in sin, and the prophets warned them, and the preachers proclaimed the truth on them, uh, to them, and check, tried to check them, tried to tell them to come back to the Lord, and they did not, the judgment of God came upon that whole nation. They were carried away into captivity. But then, not only just a whole nation, the whole earth, the whole earth. That's what we're reading about in the time of Noah. The whole earth, if the whole earth will go in the way of evil, the judgment of God will also come upon them. In Isaiah chapter 24. Isaiah chapter 24, reading from verse 1. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be, as with the people, so with the priest. As with the servant, so with the master. As with the maid, so with her mistress. As with the buyer, so with, her sell so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. 
as was the taker of usury, so was the giver of usury to him. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languishes and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. Why? Verse 5. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws and changed the ordinance and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, as the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate, therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burnt, and few men left. You see, the judgment of God will come. If you join the multitude to do evil, judgment will come upon the multitude and come upon you. Look at verse 17. Fear and the peach and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the fountains of the earth do shake. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. You see, we're reading about the judgment of God. Verse 21, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth, of the earth, upon the earth so you can see judgment determined upon the people that forget god upon the people that forget the ways of god now look at the new testament and see that the world in which we live now the earth in which we live now is preserved and reserved unto the judgment the fair indignation of god the wrath of god in second peter chapter 3 reading from verse 5 second peter chapter 3 from verse 5 for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. This is drawing a lesson from the time of Noah, that the earth overflowed with water, perished. There are some people that will tell you that, oh, now God has changed. It's a merciful God now. Nothing like that can happen anymore. There is no judgment like that anymore now. If you are listening to the news, you will find that there are earthquakes that are just destroying thousands and millions of people. What is that? Judgment of God. You will find sometimes drought. And they say natural mishap, natural disaster, just devastating whole communities and destroying many people. What is that? The judgment of God. Look at verse 7. But the heavens and the earth which are now, the heavens and the earth which are now at this present time, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto, the, unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition upon godly men. In verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth and the works that are therein, and the earth and the works that are therein, and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. All the things that the people of the world are amassing today, all the things the people of the world are accumulating today, and all the things that backsliders are accumulating today, all the things that some people are accumulating, and they are forgetting God, they will soon be destroyed. And they will pass away with fervent heat. You see today in this world in which we live, Holiness is almost a forgotten virtue. But remember, those who forget holiness, they forget God. And those who forget God will face eternal damnation. The sins which God was angered with in the days of Noah are the same as the sins of this modern generation. And God is no less angry with the people of today. The souls of men are no different today than they were in the days of Noah. Today, sin is still sin. In whatever time sin is found, 
in whomsoever sin is found, sin will be punished. There is no respect of persons with God. But glory be to God. Glory be to God that even though those were dark days, yet there was a man and his family that found grace in the sight of God. Glory be to God that he never leaves himself without a witness. That in the days of Noah, he found grace in the sight of God. The same thing in the, in the days in which we are living today. Oh yes, sins are multiplying. Immorality is multiplying. Backsliding is multiplying. Because the love of many is waxing cold. Iniquity is abounding. Yes, we know that. Backsliding is multiplying. Apostasy is multiplying. Just in consonance, just in conformity with the spirit of the last days. That evil things will multiply. We wicked men will be worse and be waxing worse and worse. Yet in the midst of it all. In the midst of all the corruption. In the midst of all the evil. In the midst of all the multiplicity of wickedness and iniquity and sin. Yet you will find there are people that distinguish themselves as peculiar people. And they find grace in the sight of God. But I need to remind you. It's only a few. It's only a few. It's only a few. Many are called, but few are chosen. And the disciples asked the Lord, Are there few that shall be saved? And I want to tell you, don't listen to the people that are telling you that you know the world will become better. Before the coming of the Lord, they say the world will become better. There's nothing like that. The prophecy of the word of God is that only a few, only a few, oh yes, will preach the gospel, will tell everyone, but to remember the word of God without holiness, no man shall be saved. And I want to just remind you, brothers and sisters, God is not going to lower the standard to accommodate a lot of people to come in. God is not going to change the word of holiness. The word of truth, the word of righteousness, that many people may just come in. God is not going to patch up anybody. He's not going to pet anyone. He wants you to discover the power of God that can break the power of sin in your life. And you will find grace in the sight of God. We thank God for a person like Noah that found grace in the sight of the Lord. In Genesis chapter 6, reading from verse 8. God's grace for Noah. Genesis chapter 6 verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace is the foundation of every life that is well pleasing to God. All flesh had corrupted his way on the earth. But Noah was that man that singled himself out. He found grace to swim against the current of public opinion and public conduct. He was as a lily among the sons whose godly life with God marked him as peculiar to the world around him. The condition of the world was really dark, corrupt, polluted, evil, very sinful, but it was righteous and perfect in that generation. What a testimony to the sufficiency and the keeping power of divine grace. Let's learn something here. No matter how dark, no matter how sinful your own community and environment may be, you may be the only Christian in your family. You may be the only Christian in your village. You may be the only Christian among your relatives. You may be the only Christian in your place of work. You may be the only Christian in the area of the market where you are selling. You can still hold on to the righteous ways of the Lord. You can. You can. The grace of God is sufficient. You find in the case of Noah that even though all the people around him were evil, all the people around him were sinful, he found the sufficiency and the keeping power of the grace of God. Look at it again in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. All the surrounding was dirty. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The people were wicked and every imagination of the thoughts of their hearts were only evil continually. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The people were graceless. They were wicked. They were evil. They were corrupt. They were polluted. They were sinful and they were violent. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The people didn't care for God. They didn't care for the worship of God. They didn't care to follow God. They didn't care to even check up the standard of God's word. 
But Noah found grace in the eyes of God. There are three things we discover in his life. Look at verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. You see that? Noah was a just man. When God was displeased with the rest of the world, Noah kept his integrity and distinguished himself from everyone else. He was a just man. That means he was justified before God by faith in the promised seed. Christ had not come, but the seed of the woman had been promised. Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, the Mediator, the promised seed, he had been promised. He had not come, but then this man Noah became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. He was looking ahead, looking ahead to the one to come. We are looking back to Calvary. We are looking back to Christ who has died for us. We are looking back to what Christ had done. Look, look at this. If Noah looking forward to the promised seed could obtain righteousness by faith, we who now know that the work has been accomplished, the price has been paid, the sacrifice had been given. Christ has paid the whole price as we look back by faith to what Christ has done. Today we can be justified by faith and we can become possessors and heirs of the righteousness which is by faith. God looks now with an eye of favor upon those who sincerely look up to him with an eye of faith. Another thing we read about Noah, he was perfect in his generations. What does that mean? That means he and his family kept themselves separate from their moral evil around them. The third thing, and Noah walked with God. And he walked with God. That means he was righteous and blameless in the sight of God. Morally sound, morally righteous and blameless and perfect and holy in the sight of God. And though judgment came, though judgment came, he was able... He was able to avoid and to escape the judgment of God. Do you know judgment is coming? There's a great day coming. That's what we're told. A great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by. It will come. When the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left. The question I'm asking you today is, are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Already we sank today. I dreamed of that the great judgment morning had done and the trumpet had blown. I dreamed that the nations had gathered to judgment before the white throne. From the throne came a bright shining angel and stood on the land and the sea and swore with his hand raised to heaven. The time was no longer to be. At that time when there shall be weeping and wailing. At that time when the Lord shall be told of their faith. At that time when even the great men of this world will cry for the rocks and the mountain to fall upon them. Where will you be? Will you be like Noah that found grace in the sight of the Lord? The rich man will be there with his money, but his money will melt and vanish away. He'll become a pauper. He will stood as a poor person before the judgment seat of God. His death will be too heavy to pay. The great man will be there. His greatness will vanish away. Will be left far behind after death has come. The angel will open the records and will not find a trace of their greatness. But thank God, there will be the widow. The widow that, will, that knows God, that finds favor with God and grace in the sight of God. God will remember them. He will remember their cries. There will be no sorrow in heaven forever. God will wipe all tears from their eyes. But then the gambler, the gambler too will be there. The drunkard will be there. The man who has sold the drink and the people who are given the license, all of them will be there. What a terrible day it will be when the sinners will sink deep into hell. Even the so-called moral man. He'll be at the judgment. He'll discover that his self-righteous rags would not do. The men that have crucified Jesus, do you? They, they thought they were righteous. And the people that have put off salvation not tonight, I'll get saved by and by. No time to think of religion, of righteousness, of holiness now. At last, they'll find time to die. And what a weeping, what a wailing when the lost will be told of their faith. 
they'll cry, they'll pray, but their prayer will be too late. What will happen to you at that time? Will you be like Noah, finding grace in the sight of the Lord? Finding grace in the sight of the Lord. Today, the grace of God is available because the Bible says in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, For the grace that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Salvation is available unto all. Holiness is available unto all. Purity is available unto all. For the grace that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly loss we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearance of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity no iniquity remaining in you he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works you know what whatever be the condition of the world around us God's grace is able to keep us righteous holy and upright if we are willing and desirous to walk with God and whatever be the conditions of other churches in these last days when many are falling away from the truth when false prophets are multiplying, when carelessness is becoming the order of the day, when immorality, iniquity is expanding and abounding, whatever be the conditions of other churches in these last days, God is able to keep his church, his true church, glorious, not having spot or wrinkle or any sort of but holy and without blemish. If the true bride of Christ, the true bride of the bridegroom, will keep our eyes on Christ, our perfect example and our Lord. Where do you stand today? The judgment of God is coming. All will be there. Will you escape the judgment of God? Escape for your life. Escape for your life. Look not behind thee. This is the time to escape from the judgment of God. Why don't you get on your knees or get on your feet and call upon the name of the Lord? That you will not be swept away with the iniquity, the immorality, the, uh, the evil, the pollution, the corruption that is in the world in this age. The rebellion. The rebellion and the sin that is in the world in this age, that God will help you to find grace in the sight of God. If you have not been born again, when are you going to be born again? When are you going to be born again? Get on your knees or get on your feet and pray and cry unto the Lord your God and say, God, I do not want to perish with the world. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. This whole world is reserved unto fire reserved to the judgment of God but you can call upon the Lord today and receive the mercy of God and receive the grace of God and receive the pardon and the forgiveness of God and receive the peace of God in your life and it will give you the heart a new heart a new life and it will make you a new creature and all things will become different in your life why don't you call upon the Lord today do you want to wait until judgment will fall those people of Noah's days Noah preached unto them because the Bible called Noah a preacher of righteousness. They never listened. They never listened. They were so saturated with evil. They were so encompassed with evil. They were so bent on their evil ways that they neglected all the preaching of Noah. Are you neglecting the message of today? Are you neglecting the warning of this day? Are you neglecting the, one, the word of God today? Why don't you say, oh God, I don't want to perish. I don't want to die in sin. I do not want to go to hell. Judgment is certain and inevitable for the people that are living in sin. You see, there are people that are still there grumbling and saying, you know, this and this and that. Forget about everyone. Forget about everything. And just say, oh God, I need your mercy. Oh God, I need your grace. Oh God, I want you to forgive me. Don't let somebody else hinder you from getting to the kingdom of God. What so and so has done, what so and so did not give me, what opportunity did the church did not give me, they didn't make me, they didn't make me that. Forget all about that and prepare to meet the Lord your God. You need to be saved. You need to be born again. It is not office, it is not position, it is not responsibility, it is not what the church makes you that will take you to heaven. Without holiness, without holiness, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Forget all these things we are grumbling about about and call upon the name of the Lord that he will save you, that he will change your life, that you will be changed so thoroughly, change you become transparent in your life, in the day, in the night, at home, in your family, outside, in your place of work, on the street, in the bus, anywhere, everywhere you may find yourself as the day is approaching. 
as the final day is approaching, that the Lord will find you ready, that the Lord will find you worthy, that the Lord will find you pure, that the Lord will find you righteous. Prepare to meet the Lord your God. Are you born again? Are you born again? And are you doing everything that lies within your power to tell other people who are not born again, are you a preacher of righteousness? If you have found grace in the sight of God, you will preach that same grace to other people. If you have found grace in the sight of God, you will alert other people, stir up other people, proclaim the truth before other people. You will not want them to perish. You will not want them to perish. Are you preaching to others? Are you telling other people? Are you trying to gather others to depart from the worldliness and from the sin and from the iniquity, from the evil, so that they will not perish with the people in the world? I, now, Noah was able to get his own family members, his own children, his own wife, and the wives of his uh, children. Are you, are you getting your own family members? Or are you going to heaven alone and your family members are going to perish? You want your children to perish? You want the people around you to perish? Are you telling them of the grace of God? Are you telling them of the possibility of escaping from the eternal judgment of God? The fair indignation of God? Why don't you, if you have been saved, why don't you, if you are now holy, why don't you, if you have been purified and sanctified, why don't you, if you are getting ready for the coming of the Lord, why don't you tell other people? Why don't you tell them they need to repent too? Those in your fellowship, all those people that have been coming one year, two years, three years, they're still sinning. They're still sinning. Don't you think their blood may be required in your hand? Why don't you tell them? Why don't you preach the word of salvation unto them? Those that are living in the same place with you, in the same house with you, are you living before them? What example are you showing before them? Are you warning them to flee from the judgment to come? Let us cry unto the Lord today. Let us call upon the Lord today. And let us find grace in the sight of the Lord, the just, the perfect, and walk with the Lord. Make sure that you are warning the people around you that they too will flee from the judgment to come. If you do not flee from the judgment to come, that day will come. When there will be great weeping and wailing, when the lost will be told of their faith, you will cry that day, but the prayer will be too late. Today is the time you can pray. Today is the time you can call upon the Lord. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's near. Let the unrighteous forsake his way. Let the wicked people forsake their evil doings. Call upon the Lord while he may be found. The Lord is waiting to save you. He wants to save you. He wants to receive you today that you will go from this place from today to go and sin no more and be prepared to meet the Lord your God. I believe you have been blessed. Don't let this message die. Listen to it again and pass it to others. You can get more from God at the Deeper Life Bible Church. Our headquarters is Deeper Life Bible Church, Bagada, Lagos, Nigeria. Blessed are your ears for hearing these things. We'll meet in heaven if you do them. <laughs>